Chapter 26, verses 2 through 8. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar. O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. When I was choosing songs for this um, Sunday, I must have had heaven on the mind, and, um, and it goes right along with the message because Pastor Tim is going to preach on God's plan. And now we have a treat. Um, I think we have a fellow in our congregation that speaks a language that probably, or a language that probably none of the rest of you do, uh, uh, that I know of. We have a fellow that's been worshiping, worshiping with us by the name of Richard, and he is going to interpret for us the next hymn when we all get to heaven. And we're going to uh, use no instruments the second time through so the praise band can watch him interpret.
who ever would have known that Richard could do that? That was great. <laughs> thanks for sharing that with us, and thanks, uh, uh, what's your name over there on the piano? Karen. <laughs> Karen. Karen, yeah, Karen for uh, making that happen today. This is great. Um, glad that you are here at Harbor of Joy this morning, and uh, I want to tell you something else that is quite am amazing. The men's breakfast is always the first Sunday, I mean the first Saturday of the month. Yesterday, for everyone who was there, all of a sudden the waitress came over and said, uh, I got a card here for Harbor of Joy. Who do I give it to? And then they all pointed to me. <laughs> and I go like, uh, and then she said, uh, I just want you to know that uh, your meals have been paid for. Somebody came in and gave a gift card, and I want to read the card that we received. Of course, we didn't know this was going on. It says here, uh, thank you so much. And of course, you know, what do guys want to do? They want to find out who did this <laughs> right away. So we thought I'd read it today, and whoever is turning really red or slips down into the pew, we know then that you are the culprit <laughs> who did this. But I said, they don't want to know who, who did it. But it says this, thank you so much for the time you give, the hearts you warm, the smiles you make, you're appreciated. And then it's written by her hand, or his hand, I don't know who did this, um, but I think only a woman would do this. Guys don't think of things like this. <laughs> I did ask Al Holman if he did this, and everybody there at the table said, no, he wouldn't do that. <laughs> this is a cup of cold water to you. A token of great appreciation for the wonderful role models you are. Harbor of Joy is blessed to have so many respectful men. Thank you. And of course, there's something else said here, but I'm not going to say that. But uh, I just thought, and then there was a gift card in there that, uh, I mean, the whole meal for all of us was like 86 bucks. But that was all taken care of. And then there was another gift card in there for $100. So what we didn't use goes towards the other $100 gift card. So whoever you are, thank you so much. And uh, I believe John Arthur had said this, because he's kind of new to the church. But he said, that's one thing about Harbor of Joy that he's noticed is that there's such a generosity, the giving of people. And I just go like, of course, he's with the blessing box, and he sees other kinds of blessings that come that direction, and so does Dave Reef and, and uh, Ken Hansen, of the generosity and the things that are given towards other people. So, I mean, I just want to say thank you to whoever you may be, because it was quite a stunning, jaw-dropping moment. I think we all were going like, so thank you, whoever you are. So who's got a, all of a sudden, a real hot flash? Or, uh, or, or is blushing? Okay, you're safe then. We don't know who you are. And if you're watching by, by Zoom because you, you knew this was going to happen and you didn't have to do this, you, you understand from my heart, from all the other guys on Saturday, yesterday morning, for what you have done. Just want to let you know that, uh, if you know this already, but Labor Day weekend is the last summer holiday. After tomorrow, it's back to the grind. To the salt mines, unless you're retired. Then you kind of go like, yeah, it's just like any other day. But uh, we uh, also know that Highway 71 is going to be under road construction. So you don't want to go too far north because you will not get to the north side of like uh, Okaboji or Spirit Lake uh, starting on Tuesday. So it means we're going to have to be going around if you live north and uh, probably not use 71. But you know all about this already depending upon where you live. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so I told my wife today we got to leave earlier for church because we have to use the bypass, the 86 bypass to get here. Unless you know of a, 
another way to do it. We could probably come in by a hot air balloon. But then the wind's got to be in the right direction. So. But at any rate, uh, that's going to be taking place uh, on Tuesday. One or just remind you that, uh, you know, it's not every Sunday we get to announce an arrival of a baby. So I just want you to know that uh, we congratulate Scott and Amber Wasco. And they had a baby girl on the 17th of August. And she joins, her name is Nora Irene Lou. So what are you going to call her? Okay. <laughs> Nora Lou, or Nora, or Irene Lou, I mean, it's up to you, but Nora is good. And uh, she's joined by her big sister is Charlotte, and her big brothers are Oliver and Caden. And so uh, everything is fine. They're here with us today. That's good to see. And uh, she is just a cutie. She's wrapped up as a little bug in a rug, you know, and she's a good sleeper. We hear that, which is kind of too bad. That's a, everybody should have a colicky child, I think, because you'll stop having kids after that. Um, do, do want you to know that uh, this Wednesday we're having something special here as well. It's, if you're interested with Joy Kids or Joy Us, uh, we're going to meet here at 530. It's a rally night that we're going to be taking place, Rally Day. If you're interested, it's kind of res reg registration. If you want to be a part of that, it's after school on Wednesday. On Wednesday, starting the 20th of September is when we start getting going with our Joy Kids and Joy Us. And possibly this year we'll have even a confirmation class that will, as the kids get out of the sixth grade, and they kind of go like, now what do we do? Or where do we go? It's going to say, well, we're going to offer a confirmation class to those kids so they can still come and be a part of that on Wednesday nights or Wednesday after school as, as well. So uh, supper is already planned. Amy's taking care of that. You don't have to worry about bringing anything. It will be here. She wants to just meet with the parents, registration, and then we're going to do a game of kickball so no one can park in the parking lot because that's where we're going to play kickball. And I just want you to know ahead of time, I am the all-time pitcher. <laughs> okay? So no arguing, no fighting. And I'll have a whistle, and I might have to eject some of you out of the game if you think I'm cheating or something. Uh, but I can do that because I'm the pastor here. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that's going to be taking place this, uh, this coming Wednesday from 5.30 to 7. We'll probably have to get out of the parking lot before 7 o'clock because there's an AA meeting that does meet here on Wednesday nights as well. So we'll figure that out as, as well. We did have a meeting this past week with widows and because uh, we have a lot of widows here at Harbor of Joy. We counted up as over 15 widows. There's probably closer to 20 when it comes down to that. And we found out that there's widowers. There's men that have lost their spouse as well. There's about a half a dozen men in the church here. So it's just a preliminary thing that we've gone through. But here's something that came out of that meeting. It's like uh, the widows would like to have phone numbers of other widows so that they could just call and talk to one another. Because it gets lonely. And they don't know if they can call someone or can talk or if they wanted to go to Hobby Lobby and Spencer for someone to ride along with them so that they don't have to go by themselves. These are some of the things that came out of that meeting. And the widows are not looking for anyone to, you know, to, uh, you know, they're not concerned about someone doing their lawn or raking or, or doing the leaves out of the rain gutters type of a thing. Uh, they would like to know, though, who, who they could call somebody reputable in the community that they could call in those, even if, a, you know, the battery goes off, the battery goes off in your, Smoke detector, you get that little cricket, that chirp, drives you crazy. But they probably have never changed that before. But if you, uh, but if you would like to do that or you'd say it'd be available, just let either Amy know, call, or, or, or myself know that so we can put a little database together of saying, okay, if this comes up, 
of call because these people don't mind being called. They will help if they can. And so we'll just kind of go from there type of, type of a thing. And so um, we just got, want to know if there's any men in the church that would like to do this. I know you, some of you have volunteered to do this before, but nothing's ever come of it. But now we want to make something happen. And so uh, we're not excluding widowers by any means, but this is just an area where a lot of times churches just don't think about doing something or having a ministry in helping people go through loss and grieving and sorrow and things like that. And women are able to do that better than men are, just so you keep that in mind, uh, because women are more sociable. Guys are more, I'm going to go fishing so I don't have to talk to anybody. And if I cry in my boat, no one will see me. You know, who knows? But, I mean, if there's something we can do for men, teach me. Teach me. All right, and uh, we'll do this also as a church together. So that's uh, all the announcements that I am going to give here this morning because I think that's enough. And let's just have a word of prayer together. I'll turn it back over to the praise band. Oh, by one more thing. Bob Floss will be back next Sunday. Just so you know, he will be back. So. Tim, Tim, can I interrupt? I had two more things I wanted Tim to add, and he forgot. What's that? <laughs> he, What's that he's, he's feeling really bad because I have a microphone, so he can't stop me. Um, if um, for Wednesday night, I would like congregation members to come just to show the kids support, even if you're not going to volunteer help during um, Joy, Joy Us, Joy Kids um, during the school year. Also, I need... I would like at least three people to help serve the food, which is the most important thing you need to ask. Three people to serve. I'll have everything ready. I just need to be able to come and put it on the plates, okay? Did I forget that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's pray. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Yep. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone that has come through the doors today. Thank you for uh, little Nora being here first time in church, more than likely at least here. And so we just pray that your hand would be upon her and her mom and dad and her sister and her two brothers and that she would grow up hearing about Jesus over and over and over again like I know she's going to. Thank you for her to have such a wonderful mom and dad as well. So we just pray also you beat the grandparents, the aunts and uncles and all those that are affected by her coming into this world. You have created her, you have a plan for her, and uh, we just have to wait to see kind of what that all is. But may you bless her, we pray. And um, thank you for everyone that is here, Lord, with the many different kinds of burdens and things on people's minds, that uh, they're glad to be in church because they can lay these things at the foot of the cross, whatever they may be. And uh, Lord, help those that are still... Um, celebrating the win of the Hawkeyes, that they can focus on Jesus here this morning, as well as uh, hearing your voice in our hearts and in our lives. Use us, Lord. Use us today and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tim, I don't think you're quite done yet. What? It says I'm not in done the yet? bulletin that says brief oh, okay. order for confession gotcha. and forgiveness. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. See? He's going to take our microphone. You get used to the way you used to do things, and now it's not that way. So here, okay. There is no song. I was waiting for a song to be after the welcome and the announcements. Being there is none, we will continue on in our bulletin. <laughs> Because it is the first Sunday, which means it is our communion Sunday as well, where it says this, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Very good. Almighty Lord, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, 
And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take time and spend some one-on-one with the Lord here this morning whereby you can confess your sins and uh, or praise the Lord for what you see him do around you or what he's doing in your life today. Let's take some time in silence, just you and God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, us, and lead us, us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in your mercy, you have given us your Son, who has laid down his life for us so that we may have forgiveness for our sins, as well as eternal life that you give to us as well. Amen. Would you stand while we sing this sweet by and by? somewhere along the way here that I forgot my book up on the altar. So that's why I had to leave and come back. 
invite you to stand as we hear God's word here this morning. It comes from Matthew. We are going to be going through Matthew because that's the, the uh, pericope that's used throughout this year, the book of Matthew, the gospel, looking at chapter 16, verses 21 through 26. Matthew 16, 21 through 26. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never, ever, ever, ever happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in the mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If Anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, those are some pretty penetrating questions. And some of the things that take place here in this text are, they kind of give us a jolt. Needed, a needed jolt. because we need to hear what's going on here even today as it was back then. So help us to stay awake and uh, have our ears open and our hearts open to you today and your Holy Spirit as we hear your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And you may be seated. The time is right for Jesus to tell his disciples what God's plan is for him. It's not the kind of plan that you would expect or you would think. But that he is going to Jerusalem and he tells his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and there I will suffer from those you would never, ever expect, the religious ones. He tells them at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, it would also involve the Sadducees or the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, which would be made up of both of those groups. But those are the ones that Jesus knew were going to not only make him suffer, but he says to his disciples that I must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. A lot of times we forget that last part. But to the disciples to hear that, it is pretty incredible. This is the first time, the first place in Matthew where Jesus makes it very clear of what's going to happen to him. Before in Matthew, he alludes to it in different ways. But here's the first time where the disciples 
cannot say, well, we didn't really understand what you talked about. They probably didn't understand everything he had said before, but here he makes it very, very crystal clear of why he's going to go to Jerusalem and what will happen to him there. And they'll connect the dots as time goes on and understand a whole lot more what they just heard him say. What's very interesting is that it is Peter, one of the 12 disciples, the one who said at, at Caesarea Philippi, that was last week's message, that he is the Christ. Jesus had asked his disciples, now, you know, who do people say that I am? And he heard from them, but then he said to them very pointedly, who do you say that I am? That's a very important question, even for us today. Who do you say that Jesus is for you or to you? How you answer that is very important. You can't go by, well, my grandma said this to me, or my, my spouse said this to me, or my kids said this to me. You can't go by that. It's what do you personally believe who Jesus is? Peter, who got the question right, and he said, you are the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, after Peter says that, Jesus had to smile. And to look at Peter as the rest of the other disciples that were with him at Caesarea Philippi, and, and he said, uh, you know, Peter, what you just said could not be revealed to you unless my father told you this. It's not going to come out of your own head, your own mind. But thankfully, his mind is on heavenly things at this particular time. And Jesus says, that I will build my church. And he, he, said, he looks at Peter, who's in the, in the uh, Greek name that is given to Peter, it means rock, but it's a small rock. It says that the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome his church. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he told his disciples, now just be quiet. Don't tell anybody that you heard that I am the Christ or the Messiah. Keep that to yourself. So Peter himself has got to be feeling pretty good. I just answered the Lord correctly. I identified who he was. He said that God revealed this to me. You know, he's on cloud nine. And shortly after this is when Peter takes Jesus aside from the other disciples. You can kind of see he, he's uh, kind of strutting his stuff a little bit. He's the valedictorian of his class right now. And he says, Lord, come on over here. I've got to say something to you. And so Jesus goes over to him, and Peter says to Jesus, this will never happen to you, what you just told them, that you're going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to suffer, and you're going to die, and you're going to raise yourself on the third day, on the third day again. He said, never, ever is that ever going to happen to you. And here's where Jesus calls him Satan. So how do you go from <laughs> saying that he's the Christ, and now Jesus is calling him Satan? Ever thought of that? I don't think it made Peter feel too good. You'd have to say, what? What did you just call me? And Jesus would say, you heard me right. You're Satan. Get behind me. 
Jesus also told Peter, you're a stumbling block. And uh, it's like being called, you're a space cadet. But I think there's a very teachable moment here that Jesus is going to make to his disciples and to Peter himself. Peter has a way of opening mouth, inserting foot, and his foot will go beyond the knees. I've done that a few times myself. But here's a question. Was Peter full of pride for identifying Jesus as the Christ? Did he take pride in saying, oh, I got this right, everybody else didn't have a word to say, or if they did say something, it wasn't like my answer. Na, 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 na. You think he had a little bit of pride going on because he was the only one of the disciples that said that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Was Peter feeling a little bit too big for his britches and he needed to be brought down a few notches? It's called humility. Where you become lower than anyone else. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. We find that in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14 It's kind of in reference to Satan himself or the devil. That even in Isaiah, the Old Testament, it talks about, it says, I will make myself like the most high. Pride. I will be like God. You can go back to the Garden of Eden. What did the serpent say to Eve? If you bite from this fruit, you will become like God. So God's kind of holding out on you. But if you just bite, you're going to see things that are going to be great things. God is trying to hold things back from you. So just bite the fruit. And she looked at it. It looked great. It was a wonderful piece of fruit. And she ate, and that's when sin entered into the world. Call it the fall of mankind. We go to Ezekiel, another prophet, chapter 28, verse 17. And there again is reference to pride. And it's talking about Jesus, well, about God who had created one of the most beautiful angels there ever was. And that's really what Satan was like in the beginning. God created him is one of the most beautiful angels. But something happened to this most beautiful angel. And it says in Ezekiel 28, verse 17, that this angel said You're, that he was just as good as God. And he gave up all those things that God had given to him. And again, it becomes a pride. And we look at what is the the main characteristic of, of the devil and of Satan. It's being proud. Pride. We can think that we know more than Jesus. And isn't that what Satan believed about himself with God? He was just as good of God, if not better. And that was his downfall. You know, there's a saying that we uh, often say, as we we hear growing up, pride before the... Yeah. And there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? People who think they're really something, it's going to catch up to them. Somewhere along the way. And they will fall. You find it with pastors. Probably were great pastors at one time. And they find themselves getting into trouble with immorality.
It happens to people in the business world. It may have happened to your next door neighbor or the one across the street or somebody that you know in your life. Thought they were really hot stuff, really tremendous person. And then fell because of pride. Did the disciples think that Jesus, I mean to follow Jesus, would be something easy to do? And Peter's the one that says, that's never going to happen to you, Lord. You're not going to suffer, and especially you're not going to die by these guys. Forget that. Jesus answers Peter back, as well as the disciples. Maybe he's talking to the disciples and Peter can still listen to this. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If you lose your life for me, you will find it and you will save it because of Jesus. You do it any other way, you're going to lose your life because it doesn't involve or include Jesus in your life. Here's the deal. When Peter heard Jesus talk about going to Jerusalem and what was going to happen to him, and Jesus definitely said, must this must take place where he'll be killed. I mean, he'll be murdered. When Peter spoke that this will never, ever happen to you, what is he really doing? He's telling Jesus that he's against what he just said. He's in opposition to Jesus suffering his death I don't know what he did with the resurrection, but that really wasn't even in, in Peter's mind. But that's why Jesus called Peter Satan. Satan doesn't want anyone to hear about Jesus Christ and what he did for all of mankind. Satan does not want you to hear anything about Jesus Christ. He will do whatever he can to keep you from reading the Bible. He'll do whatever he can in any government, any country, keep the Bible out of our country. And anyone who is found with a Bible or trying to smuggle in a Bible, they are going to be put in prison, they'll be tortured, and some will maybe even will die and have done so. But eventually the disciples ended up doing this very thing with their lives, except for Judas Iscariot. But the disciples even went and denied themselves. They picked up their cross and they went to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. And churches were sprouting up all over the place. As they've been doing over the centuries and even up till today. Can God really use you in starting a church or being a part of a church to help a church be what God wants that church to be? Can God really do that with you? The answer is yeah, he can. And I speak not just flippantly. I speak it because this is the last thing I thought I would ever, ever do in life is to be a pastor. Pastor. 
One of my mentors early on in the ministry said, Tim, do everything you can not to go into the ministry. Because if you can't, because <laughs> if you can't, can't stop from going to the ministry, then you know that God is calling you to go there. But by that time, I'm going like, well, I think I did everything. And I find no other joy in life than talk to people about Jesus and to see people come to faith and the people to grow in their faith and to be people that they once were, aren't, aren't that way anymore, that they are growing as believers in Christ. It's better than planting flowers. Can you imagine that? There's two questions that have often been asked by someone. You probably heard them along the way in your life at one time or another. It says, uh, what good is it if a man can gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Of course, the answer to that is a negative. It's called nothing. There's nothing that you can have. That would make you not want to stay away from Jesus. But then again, you kind of think of it, yeah, there is. It happens all the time. Why are there storage sheds being built in this area? It's because people have too much stuff. And guess what? You don't find a U-Haul being pulled by a hearse out to a grave so that the stuff can go with you. You can gain the whole world. I think that's kind of a hyperbole, an exaggeration. But people think you can gain a lot of different things that is of this world and take it with you. But you can't. You can't. Little and less is more. The world says no. You got to have this. You got to get an E car or an E pickup. E is for electric, by the way. You know. So you go out and you get one. Does it make you feel any better? Probably for a while, but it's pride that makes you feel good. Look what I got. I want to show my neighbors that I got an E car. Or I'll drive it around and put a little smirk on my face. It's not going to go with you to heaven. You can drive it around all you want in hell. That's why they call it a hot rod. <laughs> so what is God's plan for you? His plan is something that we probably do not like to hear. When he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. But this is God's plan for each of us. God's plan is that he wants you and me to be in heaven. To know that we are saved from our sins. That's his plan. Always has been. Always will be. And that's why he sent his only son. His Holy Son did everything that we could not do. So he did it all. You've sung the, the, the hymn, Jesus paid it all? That's, it's true. He did everything for you. It's just for you to receive that as a gift from God to you. So 
So do you have in mind the things of God or the things of men? Just like in our James Bible study on Thursday, it's like, you know, the little tongue that we have, we can bless people with it, but we can also curse people. And it's just a little part of our body. But it's true, isn't it? It's very true. So God's plan for you, which it always has been, is that you know that you are saved and that you will be in heaven with him. To have peace with God. That's what God has always desired and will bring to you. If you'll humble yourself, and receive his son Jesus into your heart and life. Make him the priority and not yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us know what your plan is. The sad part is that there's a lot of people today who don't even know that you have a plan or to know what this plan is. Many, many people think it's, it's what I do in life. There's a reason why God should let me into his heaven. And that's called works. We are told in scriptures that we are saved by grace through faith. Not by works. It's always a gift. So who will be brave enough this morning to receive this gift? Who will admit that they have heard God calling their name today or nudging them somehow, some way, that they need Jesus in his or her life? Lord, I don't know, but you do because you're God. So may you do what only you can do. And may you know what's going on in the hearts and lives of everyone that's here today. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body. Take and eat until I come again. In the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks to his father, he said to his disciples, this is my blood. Drink all of it. It's given for you. And do this until I come again. If you have been, well, if you're here for the first time, or you have, you're not familiar with how we do communion, it's open to everybody. You can come if you want. You don't have to come if you don't want either. There are, um, if you have gluten, there are little packets in here that you can take. No one else will have touched. Gluten-free wafer. If you would rather not have wine, hold your hand out like this, and they'll make sure that you get grape juice. You can't tell the difference because it's all purple up here. But if you go like this, they'll know that you want grape juice. And if they don't give you grape juice, you just throw the wine back at them. No, just kidding. But the reality of what takes place here is it's very, very serious because God 
is interested in what's going on in your life and in your heart. And so when you come, it's not for anybody else is the reason why you come. You come because you want to do, take business to God. You want to do business with him. It doesn't matter what anybody else is thinking or what they might see or what they might think or say about you. But come to Jesus. So I'm just going to move this because you'll be ushered. And I'll invite those that are going to serve to come. And we will begin our service. Oh yeah, there's two stations. One is you come up front, receive, and then uh, you can go back and sit down. The other one is that you, you're invited to come up to the up to the railing. You can kneel, you can stand, you can spend as much time as you want up here. You'll be served up here as well. And uh, stay however you want. When you're finished, you can go back down and sit where you, where you have uh, been sitting. So with that, I invite those to come to serve, to come at this point in time. So Iris, you kind of know what to do. You're going to do that basket, right? Okay. And then you got that one up there, okay? All right. Here you go, Iris. That's for putting your cups in. Okay. Do we have an usher? shed for you, child. Thank you. 
that's given to you Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Against my heart, find your own. 
Did we miss anybody? Everybody got served? Just want to make sure. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now given you his holy body and blood through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We forgot the Apostles' Creed, didn't we? Okay, here we go. Jeff, I don't know if you can get it back up there or not. Here we go. Let us stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Before we sing our last song, and Amy comes up here to help a little bit, um, I just want to thank all of you that have been uh, providing treats and doing the greeting. Mm -hmm. We thank Bobby and Scott and Bonnie today and all of you that are, have done that. For some reason, that's my responsibility. So um, it's nice to have you sign up back there so I don't have to be calling you and pestering you. Treats just mean a cookie and a bar. We don't have to have lunch, just <laughs> cookie or something. <laughs> but if you want to sign up, I'd sure appreciate it, especially those that are going to be gone in the wintertime, if you would sign up before you go. OK. <laughs> I want you to stand and sing this very last song. This is one of my favorites, I'll Fly Away.
God.